our current situation when it comes to COVID-19, uh, the novel coronavirus. There are 438,000 plus cases documented around the world, roughly 19,000 deaths and over 11, 111,000 people have been deemed recovered. The uh, coronavirus has been detected in 171 countries around the world. Um, and the big development over the last one to two weeks has been a real shift in the epicenter of this virus from Southeast Asia to Europe, and it's starting to make even more headway in North America. So as the cases are dropping, um, and as South in Southeast Asia, China, Korea, um, Japan, we're seeing a huge explosion of cases and both deaths and recoveries occurring in the Western Hemisphere. So uh, just to review, 80% of all cases are either asymptomatic or have symptoms consistent with a mild cold uh, up to perhaps a bad flu. These include body aches, fevers, coughs. Overall, what we're seeing is a mortality of roughly one to 3% total, and that is likely overestimated at this time. Um, it, it's overestimated like, uh, because we don't have a great sense of what the, uh, the total number of cases are, especially with those very mild cases, um, which are may not be seeking medical attention and may uh, not be counted. The mortality in the United States uh, and mirrors what we've seen in most of the Western and Eastern world, which is the age over 65 has the uh, highest risk factors. The mortality there ranges from roughly 3% all the way up to 11% based on age. Um, this age group makes up over 45% of the total people who are being hospitalized and over 80% of all the people who have died from COVID. Once you break the age of 85, your risk goes up significantly more, up somewhere between 10 and 27% mortality. Um, and this has been consistent with what we've seen in Italy, what we've seen in um, China and Iran. Um, the, the data for this part of it seems very consistent across the board. COVID is, uh, it is in the coronavirus family, which includes a large number of cough and cold viruses, but has also included uh, SARS and MERS-CoV over the last few years, which have made news. We have sustained person-to-person -person transmission across the world right now, uh, and it is spread primarily by droplets. So when someone who's infected coughs or sneezes, they produce this cloud of droplets, which have uh, virus particles in it. When someone walks through that particle, those particles come into contact with their mouth, their nose, their eyes, and um, someone else can become infected in this manner. How sick that person will get really varies from person to person. Some people are having, once again, very mild symptoms, coughs, fevers, shortness of breath. And this, um, but it can extend all the way up to becoming very severe with pneumonia, kidney failure, um, and death. That is happening in a very small percentage of the population. Um, but it is important to note that those who are at risk for the worst outcomes are those over the age of 60 who have chronic conditions, primarily heart, lung, blood pressure issues, and weak immune systems. Um, now, we've been saying over and over again, the vast majority of people have very mild symptoms. So why are we going so far as to institute uh, lockdowns, quarantines, and um, travel restrictions, which have really fundamentally changed the way that most of us live our lives? A big part of that has to do with the demographics of our population. In the United States, over 20% of the population is over the age of 60 and accounts for over 60 million people. Europe is seeing similar numbers where over 27% of their population is over the age of 60. Um, and with the high hospitalization rates in that population, um, we're seeing really profound impacts on the ability of the healthcare system to support 
those people who are getting sick, but also everyone else who needs routine care or may have emergencies which come up. Uh, one other effect that we've been seeing a lot more of over the last several weeks is um, the psychological effects of the pandemic. These are not directly related to the virus, but they have everything to do with all the media attention that is coming out. Um, there's a fair degree of panic and uh, concern being raised, in some cases appropriately, in some cases not appropriately, about the virus. And we're seeing a lot of anxiety, depression, people who may have been at risk for it before, but also in other people who are um, starting to have issues with the constant degree of stress. In addition, um, the primary method by which we're trying to prevent the spread is social distancing. And a lot of people, that is exacting its own toll, um, being told that you cannot uh, socialize and commune with other people has psychological effects, which can be problematic. And um, we wanna highlight some of the things that you can do through United Health Group services to help combat this if you, someone you love or someone you know is starting to experience these effects um, because it is a service we offer and it is just as important to take care of your psychological health, health as it is to take care of your physical health. So treatments um, for COVID-19, the, the vast majority of people are being treated with supportive care. What this means is supporting your hydration, making sure you're staying well hydrated either at home or while you're in the hospital, and then support for your breathing as necessary. Relatively few people actually require support for their breathing, but it can be something as simple as additional oxygen in the hospital, all the way up to mechanical ventilation. Um, there are a number of experimental treatments which are being implemented for people who are severely ill and they have made the news of late. Um, one thing we want to uh, reiterate here is that these treatments are really relegated for people who have the most severe symptoms and the most severe illness. We have seen a number of cases over the last week or so of um, individuals who have taken it upon themselves to try to get a hold of the medications they've heard about taken them and suffered severe side effects. A couple of them have actually died or overdosed on these medications. Um, the medications that are being discussed, primarily chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, zithromycin, are not benign medications. They are still very, very experimental for COVID and we are really recommending um, not to use those medications unless you are advised to by a physician. Uh, we've seen some very bad side effects and um, it is not a safe thing for anyone to do. Testing has become another area of concern. Um, the commercial laboratories in the United States have started to begin uh, testing for COVID. It was previously only state facilities and the CDC. Many hospitals have also developed the ability to do this test in the house, which has really improved the ability of uh, people to access the test. Other countries outside the United States, um, their ability to test has varied greatly. South Korea, China, Germany have great access to the test. You can get it from almost anyone who needs it immediately. However, other countries, including the US, um, Canada, and a few others are still struggling with their supplies, their supply chain. Um, so we are seeing issues with personal protective equipment uh, in the supply chain, as well as the test kits. So if you need to get the test or if you feel you may need to get the test, we're gonna talk about how you can try to access that in a few minutes. Uh, vaccine development. Um, this will ultimately be how this crisis is uh, controlled most likely. That vaccine is still 12 to 18 months away, which has a lot to do with how vaccines are developed and less to do with this specifically but we will expect that a vaccine would be available for the public in approximately one to one and a half years. So um, one of the big questions is, you know, why are we doing this? And it has everything to do with what the impact of this virus being so widespread and so contagious and uh, attacking the people that it does, what it does to local healthcare systems. Um, 
Countries are at different stages of their response. Some countries are completely overwhelmed, and you'll see that with news reports from Italy. Um, the others are trying, are busy, but are trying to manage their uh, the surge that is coming upon them. And within the United States, you'll see a wide range of this. Uh, one thing that's important to remember is that a lot of these healthcare systems that are becoming overwhelmed are becoming overwhelmed very. Uh, within the course of a week, a healthcare system can go from being busy to being completely overwhelmed. Um, and that is once again what we've seen across the world. As a result, most healthcare systems are steering all of their resources into managing this condition alone. And we're seeing uh, non urgent, routine, and elective procedures and um, care being deferred or rescheduled. So it's important when we discuss how you could access care for yourself, either for COVID or for any other condition, to bear in mind that the healthcare system is currently shifting to support all of their resources to care for COVID due to the onslaught of what is coming. What does this mean for our global mobile populations? Um, healthcare services around the world are starting to limit the services they're offering. They're canceling elective surgeries, they are canceling or deferring routine care, and all of the resources are being diverted to try to support patients who are coming in with this condition. Um, each country has a different process for how they're handling this illness. Um, some countries or states are designating specific facilities for taking care of this disease. Um, it's important for our globally mobile populations to recognize that. Um, because if they are uh, concerned or there's a uh, concern that they have COVID, they will have to access those facilities. Um, globally mobile populations will not be able to bypass these regulations, uh, which was originally considered early on, but it has become clear now across the board that they will have to go through the same processes as domestic uh, citizens. Um, another thing to realize is that the options for your healthcare and where the, uh, they can get healthcare may be limited and may be under resourced. This is particularly important for our expat populations living in areas of scarcity. Um, so, what we're advising is to have all of our members prepare for uh, this in advance. First and foremost, Identify your options for care locally. Know what are your first two to three options for if something happens, where you would go for care. Most of our expat population knows the place that they would like to go, but they need to realize that that option may not be fully available to them, either because it may be overwhelmed or they may have limited their services and may not be providing what they need, whether that's uh, COVID care or non-COVID care. Second is we're advising that they have the, some basic resources at home uh, to limit how much they need to interact with the healthcare system. So this means routine medications, making sure that they have several weeks supply on hand if something happens in the supply chain, as well as having the ability to care for basic medical concerns in their own home. So things such as routine coughs and colds, um, things that are endemic to the area. So whether it's diarrhea, other illnesses, sprains, cuts, um, basic first aid, having that available to you in your own home as you may not be able to access it outside. Um, again, you'll hear this later, but what we're finding is that moving globally mobile uh, citizens for care right now is becoming incredibly restricted. So if our population is in an area where they may not have access to the best health care, um, this time where we would normally have evacuated them to a higher level of care, that option is increasingly being taken off the table as borders are locked and as higher level facilities are becoming overwhelmed with requests both internally and externally uh, for their resources. So personal protection, uh, the answer to this in, epidemic in the short term is not going to be about a pill or a shot, but it's going to be about how do we keep each other and ourselves safe. Uh, at this point, I do want to 
just point out, uh, if anyone wants to understand social distancing, how it works and why it's important, I encourage you to Google Washington Post Corona Simulator. Uh, it's a really great article which came out last week and it demonstrates graphically why social distancing is important and how it works. Um, in the meantime though, what we want everyone to do is practice good hygiene uh, and protect yourself. Washing your hands frequently with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or using an alcohol-based sanitizer or at least 60% alcohol. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Uh, avoid close contact with people who are sick, maintaining a distance of at least two meters or six feet. Frequently clean and disinfect uh, surfaces that are frequently touched. That includes cell phones, computers, countertops, rails, doorknobs, um, and the like. When coughing or sneezing, make sure to cover your mouth uh, either into your elbow or use a tissue and make sure the tissue is disposed of in the trash can, which is closed. If you're home, uh, if you're sick, stay home. If one of your employees is sick, please encourage them to go home and uh, limit their contact with others. Uh, foregoing non-essential travel, which has become a standard uh, recommendation across all the health agencies, and following uh, rules for social distancing. Um, goal with social distancing is less about preventing illness for an individual and more about preserving our healthcare resources. So the, um, if 20% of the population or even 10% of the population over 60 becomes ill and requires hospitalization, it would very quickly overwhelm the healthcare system anywhere. Um, the objective here would be to spread out those illnesses um, over period of time so that the healthcare system can uh, preserve resources for those who are sick with COVID, but also still manage everyone else who's coming with other illnesses, whether it's needing uh, surgery for appendicitis, having heart attacks, whatever else, um, making sure that resources are preserved for everyone else who needs them. So reducing social contacts will slow the spread of infection. When we talk about uh, decreasing social contacts here, we're really talking about households, not individuals. So anyone who has children recognizes that if uh, your children go play with other children, um, if the other child is sick, your child will get sick, you will get sick. This is about taking your entire household into account when you do social distancing and limiting the interactions between your household and other households. In your own household, social distancing is very difficult, if not impossible, and not really expected. Um, but it, this remains important as an idea to protect uh, ourselves and to protect the healthcare resources for everyone. Just some do's and don'ts about social distancing um, to add some granularity to what we're talking about. Some things not to do. Avoid large gatherings, anything over 10 people um, is something you may want to avoid. Maintaining a perimeter of at least six feet or two meters of yourself when out in public. Um, avoid visiting people over the age of 60, in large part to protect them. Um, most likely those individuals who are at highest risk will become exposed by someone in their social circle. So limiting physical and uh, direct contact with them as much as possible. Don't have play dates with young children. If you have young children, um, you need to keep them indoors or away from other children. And avoid frequent trips out for shopping and to obtain the necessities. Some things you can do. On a more positive note, socialize with the immediate family and people you live with. Your household is your closest social network at this time. Video calls, phone calls, especially with people who may be isolated, uh, the elderly, uh, isolated friends and family. Please make an effort to reach out to them as we have noted the psychological effects of um, social distancing can be very lonely for a lot of people. Walking the dogs, outdoor exercise, visiting parks are all open and great activities. Listening to music, TV, reading. This is a great time to do household repairs or cleaning. Uh, 
meditation, yoga, learning to cook, gardening, driving is totally safe in this regard, working from home, and then when you do go out, combine your trips for essentials, whether it's uh, getting food, healthcare, banking, fuel, uh, to combine them so that you make as few trips out into the environment as possible is strongly recommended. Um, the CDC believes that most of us will get this uh, over the next one to two years. So the question becomes, what happens if you feel you're starting to demonstrate symptoms or you believe you may have been exposed? First things first, don't panic. As we said, the vast majority of people will have very mild illness um, and will not have bad outcomes. Avoid public places, including public transportation. Stay home and self-quarantine. Avoid contact with people who are over the age of 60 or might be at risk for other reasons. If you have mild symptoms, this is a great time to use your telemedicine resources, if at all possible, to, seek, uh, to speak with a medical provider. They can give you advice and can help you make the decision if you need to be tested or if you can manage this safely on your own without interacting with the medical system outside of uh, the telemedicine platform. If testing is advised, contact your country or local jurisdiction's health authorities for where to get testing and guidance. If you develop severe symptoms, and severe symptoms in this case really means if you start to become short of breath, very fatigued, or not able to function, then that is the time that we recommend going to the emergency department. Um, but otherwise, if possible, we recommend avoiding the emergency department. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Ben to talk about some of our travel uh, recommendations and guidance. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Arwen Decker. So, as I'm sure everyone has, has noticed, there are a number of travel advisories and restrictions that are going on here in the U.S. as well as around the world. So, we did want to, to call some attention to those. I would also just caveat by saying these these changes are really going on each day. So every day there's a new either restriction or certain places are putting in new measures. In some places they're relaxing measures. So uh, by the time we get done with this, there'll probably be a couple of new things. So just continue to check in. Um, and we are sending out a lot of alerts whenever we get uh, information on new restrictions and or advice. So what is the US government saying? The State Department, has issued their highest level of warning, level four, do not travel for global advisory. So that means everywhere outside of the world. So essentially the State Department's advice is, if you're a US citizen, avoid all international travel at this point due to the impact of COVID-19. The CDC here in the US has uh, also some travel advisories in place. They are not uh, at this point necessarily saying do not travel anywhere globally. However, they have advised to avoid all non-essential travel to China, Iran, uh, most European countries, including the UK and Ireland, and then avoid any non-essential travel in Malaysia and South Korea. For anyone who is trying to come to the US, there are going to be some, some real challenges with that. So anyone from Europe, China, Iran are not going to be able to enter. And then uh, people outside of that, most foreign nationals, will either have their visa denied or be uh, placed on a 14-day quarantine before they are allowed to enter the U.S. So uh, very difficult to travel internationally at this point, uh, whether or not you're coming here or, or, uh, or trying to, to go out of, of the U.S. From the European Union perspective, they also have travel uh, restrictions in place. All uh, external borders of uh, for countries within the 27 member states, including the UK, are closed for the next 30 days for non-essential travel. If you are already within the, the EU, you can still travel between EU member countries. So uh, anyone who is within the European Union right now is able to move between those countries. But again, anyone from outside of the EU is not able to get in for the next 30 days. Um, and there are other uh, restrictions in place. Just notably, that does not include medical staff, uh, medicine, and goods. Those will still be allowed to cross borders. 
so that they can continue to to uh, to provide the healthcare system in those in those countries with the resources that they need. So there are a couple of of uh, exceptions there when it relates to the medical. Uh, medical field. And then again, just these, these bands sort of differ by country. So there are a whole host of other countries out there which have, uh, have travel bans in place. India is not allowing anyone in. Um, China is doing certain things depending on where you're coming from and there are restrictions there. So uh, for anyone who needs to travel, it's a really good idea to take a look at uh, any advisories that may be in place. You can take a look at um, whether or not you are going to be able to come back. That's another thing that we've been really trying to tell all of our clients and folks is that uh, even if you are able to leave the U.S. and get into a particular location um, or you're able to leave whatever country you may be in, uh, are you going to be able to get back in? And so if you are having to plan an international trip today, um, it is definitely a good thing to, A, check whether or not you can even get a commercial flight there. Uh, even commercial flights we're seeing which are scheduled, about 40 to 60% of them are being canceled because of, of lack of passengers. And so rather than making that trip, they just decide it's not worth it. So um, even if you can find a commercial uh, option to travel, again, I would be prepared to, to get to the airport and essentially have the flight be canceled. If you are able to, uh, to, to go to your destination, we're pretty much advising everyone to add about a month on to their trip as there is a uh, certainly a possibility that you would be quarantined for 14 days before you're allowed to conduct your business. And then there's a very real possibility when you come back that you will again be quarantined for 14 days. So um, if you are going to travel, we would really advise everyone to bring extra supplies with them. If you are on any kind of maintenance medications or those sorts of things, definitely bring an extra supply because it is highly likely you'll experience some challenges getting home and your trip will be much longer than you originally uh, expected. So uh, again, just, just be, be cautious of that and make sure to bring extra supplies and, and extra clothes and all those sorts of good things. Uh, so what do you need to consider if you do have um, travel that is essential? So uh, first of all, again, take a look at all those travel bans and restrictions and make sure that you are actually going to be able to go, uh, as well as uh, do be prepared and participate in screening. So most international airports now are, uh, airports and ports are screening patients, uh, not patients, but screening people rather before they're allowed to enter. So you, you will likely have to participate in that. If you are found to have any symptoms or a fever, uh, again, likely you will be quarantined regardless of whether or not it is actually COVID or not. So, so expect, expect to have some delays in your travel is, is the bottom line. Up to 14 days, it could be 14 days on enter and exit. There are also a lot of questions coming in around evacuations and, um, and whether or not we are able to conduct those evacuations around the world whether or not it is a, an evacuation related to COVID, uh, another condition or a non-medical related evacuation. What I would say here is that it is becoming increasingly difficult to impossible in certain locations, depending on obviously where you are. So um, it's not that the resources do not exist, they do. Uh, but right now, most governments around the world are not really allowing for a lot of a lot of movement between their borders, and that's what we would need to be coordinating. So, coordinating with local, federal, and uh, and the um, and other country governments and health authorities as to whether or not that particular individual is going to be allowed. The other thing that I would mention around evacuations is that uh, some of the typical locations that we would evacuate to are are being overburdened right now with, with treating COVID related issues. And so some of those locations really would not be a great place to go anyway, and certainly would probably not be accepting uh, other patients. So lots of things to consider there. I, I, it's never impossible, but there are so many restrictions in place right now that it is very difficult to actually go ahead and do evacuations at this point. And then specifically evacuations for, for COVID related patients. Uh, again, there are capabilities, there are biocontained uh, evacuation processes and, and providers out there, but most uh, locations are not allowing those people to leave. So they would be isolated. They would be put into whatever system that particular country has, uh, has designated to treat all of their COVID patients and again, not be allowed to leave the country. So uh, this is also incredibly difficult. The other factor here is that there are many countries that would simply not accept uh, a COVID patient that we were trying to evacuate. So 
Uh, again, the capabilities exist, but because of the restrictions and because of the current environment, it, there are very limited availability of, um, of, of, uh, of resources to be able to do this in, in practice. Again, the resources are there, but the likelihood that we can coordinate everything and uh, the various government agencies would agree to it is, is incredibly slim. Business preparedness. We've talked about this a little bit on some of our previous webinars, but I did want to, to, to go through some of the things that we are beginning to see as we are getting a little bit further along in the pandemic. We are starting to see that those companies which have emergency response plans in place are starting to find where some of the gaps in their uh, plans are. And, and certainly it's a good opportunity to, to fill those gaps. So we are getting a lot of questions around uh, specifically locating employees around the world. That's something that, is, that is, is still causing some challenges for certain organizations, as well as being able to communicate with, with employees. So again, um, if, if any of those are, are happening, it's, it's next one's time to sort of think about how we can solve those. And certainly we are here to help uh, in, in, in those sorts of areas, as well as we are finding that a lot of, of organizations across the country have started to discover that, that some of their insurance coverages that were put in place actually have specific exclusions for pandemic events. And these could be uh, travel related policies, medical, uh, medical travel policies, as well as, as uh, business interruption policies. So there are a fair amount of questions that we are getting today around specifically exclusions for pandemic events. None of our policies have those exclusions, so we are still writing new policies. But again, it's, it's an area that if you have experienced that and, and need some help, we're happy to provide some information for you. Um, and there are options available on the market which do not have those sorts of exclusions. Another thing, just in terms of overall preparedness, uh, there, we, we just wanna sort of highlight keeping employees healthy and some of the things that, that we can do. Um, first of all, work from home and flexible schedules. A lot of, of companies today have switched to a work at home model. Those provide obviously their own challenges, but having that flexibility and really making sure that there is a, an ability for people, especially who may be sick or symptomatic to stay home. Uh, and again, if people can work from home, this is an excellent time to go ahead and do that. Providing a, appropriate workspace if there are not the ability to work at home is another thing that uh, you can do, again, if people were closer together, trying to spread out that office space. If there are certain employees that are able to work from home and others that can't, allowing those that can to go home and, and do their job from home would allow for some more distance within the offices, as well as just promoting healthy habits. So making sure people are still getting exercise, they're drinking enough water, um, washing their hands, all of those sorts of things will be very, very helpful. And then really be aware of the psychological effects of the crisis. So beyond just the fact that uh, there, are, there is so much hype around COVID-19 right now, um, again, as Dr. Arwen Decker mentioned, the psychological effect and the stress that this caused can, can be very overwhelming for certain people, for people that are not used to working from home and are now uh, essentially being asked to either shelter in place or, or limit their social contact very, very greatly. It can have some pretty profound effects psychologically. So we just want to make sure that we call that out, that it's, you know, the only challenge here is certainly not just COVID related. There are a host of other issues that come to how we're responding to this and the impact it's had to, to our, uh, all of our lives, both personal and professional. And then we will say this uh, again, but obtain information from reliable sources. There's a lot of information out there from the media um, online, which are either promoting uh, just flat out incorrect information or inaccurate information or misleading information. And so we really encourage you to get, get information from, from reliable sources. What are those reliable sources? So we are getting all of our information from the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, so the CDC here in the US. In terms of uh, tracking where and how prevalent COVID-19 is in certain locations, Johns Hopkins Center for Systematic Science and Engineering has an excellent tool which is available to everyone, which shows a map with all of the numbers. That's where we got our numbers in the beginning of this presentation. And then for anyone who, who does still need to travel, IATA Travel Center is a really, really great resource. It, it lists out all of the travel restrictions that are going on around the world, 
the availability to get in and what exceptions are there to those particular rules. So again, if you need help finding a resource to figure out um, any proposed trips and or where there are specific travel restrictions, that is a great place that has really cataloged pretty much all of them around the world. Okay, so we did mention a bit about the support and providing support to uh, employees during this particular time. Again, uh, outside of, of what you can do for, for COVID, there are a lot of heightened feelings around this, intense feelings, um, a lot of stress in the current environment, especially given how much attention is being placed on this. And that can have a real psychological uh, effect on people. Some of it can actually manifest into uh, physical symptoms like headaches, dizziness, nausea. In those cases, someone may uh, interpret that as them actually being sick and having uh, COVID, which caused even more stress. Um, so it's, it's really good just to, to call out here that uh, people are, are having some issues dealing with this in the work environment. It's really great to be able to, to create an environment that people can ask for help, um, provide resources for them to talk, and really create an open opportunity, especially if you are involved in a business that does not allow a work-at-home environment, that, that employees feel safe and comfortable telling their employer when they are sick and, and being able to stay home. The last thing any of us would want would be for someone to feel that they really couldn't disclose that they were not feeling well, come to work, and then have a much bigger issue as uh, as they continue to spread to, to all the other uh, employees in the office. So creating that environment where people understand and know it's okay if you do have any symptoms, even if they're very minor, we would rather have you stay home and, 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 and do that than come into the office is, is really important as we continue to uh, try to manage the, the spread of, of COVID now. So some of the actual resources available, EAP is something that we've really been promoting at this point. It's available telephonically. Uh, we have seen a big increase in utilization of our EAP programs. It's an excellent resource for anyone that just wants to talk through some of the challenges that, they, that they've been having adjusting to this, any of the stress that they have going on related to all of the impacts that COVID has had on all of us, as well as it can be a resource for managers who are trying to deal with the questions that they're getting from their employees and, and don't necessarily know how to, to, to answer or dealing with the increased volume and, 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 and questions that they're getting and, and the stress that that's causing on them. So obviously we offer My Wellbeing. It's an excellent uh, opportunity to, to check that out and to promote this benefit because again, um, aside from, from uh, the, the certainly the concern around COVID, it, there are a lot of psychological impacts that are going on because of this. So just wanted to call that out. It is an excellent resource and something that, that folks should be taking, uh, taking a look at. Some other resources that are available to all of our members, one, uh, My UHC and the Health For Me app. So we are posting a lot of information on there for, for folks that wanna uh, get additional information. So certainly aside from all of its normal features, um, it's a great place to be able to access resources as well as uh, sort of be able to conduct any, any kind of a business that you need, find providers internationally. That's been one of the requests we've been getting a lot from our call center uh, for, for folks that are, are looking for appropriate providers and providers that could take care of them, whether or not it's COVID related or not. Uh, certainly we're available 24 seven, so feel, feel free to call us anytime, uh, but we do also have those listings online. So if you wanted to take that and take a look, uh, all that is posted online. I mentioned the employee assistance program. Again, very good opportunity to promote that because uh, there are a lot of folks that are, are looking and grappling with this and looking for resources. So that's an excellent one. Of course, it's all virtual, so it, it fits in with our self-distancing uh, guidelines and, uh, and is, is, is um, again, an excellent opportunity. We have our intelligence center as well. So all of the alerts that, that I was talking about before related to travel restrictions and those sorts of things are going out from the intelligence center. Uh, we do also have medical information as well as security information and those sorts of things. So again, for anyone that does have essential travel and really needs to get information around what's going on in the particular location that they are, um, certainly there are, are resources around what's going on with COVID, but um, there are still other issues out there, right? It's not the only thing. There are other medical issues that are still present. There are still security challenges and those sorts of things. So um, good opportunity to check that out as well as you can sign up for our alerts. We will keep you up to date on all the latest information. It will go automatically to you and, and you'll know any kind of changes and or uh, a new, new information that we are sending out. Final two things here, virtual visits and my well-being. 
So my well-being is, uh, is another opportunity for help in terms of A, relieving stress and maintaining uh, activity during this time. That can be a challenge for certain folks. It's all virtual as well. So good opportunity to check out the resources are there and, and be able to promote just a healthy lifestyle for employees and then virtual visits and telemedicine. This is another question we've gotten quite a bit and would just say that especially if you are having a, any kind of mild illness, virtual visits is an excellent opportunity now. Um, we would certainly not recommend just showing up to either an emergency room or your regular physician's office in this current environment for several reasons. But first of all, if you don't have COVID and you go to the emergency room, for example, uh, that is where you probably have the greatest opportunity to actually get it. Um, so you could show up with something completely unrelated and, and because you are in that environment, you now uh, have been exposed and, and, and have a high likelihood of contracting it. But also, uh, again, right now the, the health systems are already being strained. So if you have just a, a mild illness, getting it checked out via virtual visits is an excellent first step. They can advise you whether or not they believe the symptoms are, are going to be um, leading you to actually seeking physical care, but if not, um, certainly can help out. And then same thing for your doctors, uh, regular doctor. If you are sick and need to see them, we would really encourage folks to call first, um, let them know your symptoms. Many practices across the country are, are separating out patients that have symptoms similar to COVID to try to uh, maintain some separation between them and, uh, and their other uh, patients. So it's, it's definitely a good, good, good idea just to check in with them to see if there are any special protocols in place. Uh, before you actually go. But anything that can be done virtually is a great opportunity. With that, I would like to sort of stop and see if there are any questions that we have and uh, and we can we can uh, start taking those questions. Just so you know, you can type questions in the chat box. So if you do have questions, feel free to go ahead and type them in there and we will start addressing any of the questions that we've got within our Q&A. Okay, so first question, I think Dr. Arwen Decker, this would be a good one for you. Um, what is a good resource for those that actually have been diagnosed with COVID-19? So uh, for anyone who's been diagnosed with COVID, uh, I think your first resource is to talk with the uh, physician who diagnosed you as far as what to do. Um, the sort of uh, the general medical advice that's been given is one question that just came into me um, was with children, what does a COVID infection look like in the setting of children um, and kids. Uh, so specifically in the area of kids, the infection has been relatively mild compared to what it looks like in adults, which is to say that uh, significantly fewer of these children have progressed to severe symptoms requiring hospitalization or um, being on a ventilator. Largely, the uh, COVID in children looks like a bad cold, which is to say fevers, coughs, um, they're going to have less energy. They might complain, the older ones might complain of some shortness of breath. Um, but this, it is not anything unusual beyond the typical cough cold that we'll see around this uh, time of year. And at the same time, uh, they're not having bad outcomes. So their outcomes are very similar to what they would be if they caught any other cough or cold. Excellent. Uh, another question that we've seen a bunch of people submit is whether or not this presentation is going to be available after the presentation, uh, after the webinar, it will be. Um, so after this event, Everyone will will have access to this. I believe it will be posted on our um, on our site, and you should all uh, be able to access a copy of this, as well as it is being recorded. So you can pull down not just the presentation itself, but there will be a recording of the uh, the webinar in its entirety. And I believe we are posting that to our YouTube channel, uh, so you can pull it from there, as well as we may be posting it online. But I'll have to bring in Aaron. Uh, or Rachel for that one to confirm. Yes, we will be posting the recording of the webinar on our website has been directed. There will be a link in your email that you'll receive after the presentation today that you can simply click on and it will take you directly to the recorded and static versions of the presentation. Excellent, thanks Aaron. 
Okay, let's see if there are any other questions that are coming in. If not, we can end a little early. Let me just go through the Q&A, see if there are any other questions that folks have submitted. So I don't see any other questions. So I will just close by saying thank you to everyone for joining us today. Certainly if you have any questions,